I always get sort of told off for oversimplifying things. And uh, am I oversimplifying it? I just want to quickly get a, a distinction between anxiety impression and depression. Mm. Anxiety is more people thinking about the future. Depression is more thinking about the past. That's a nice way is to that, look at it. Is that yeah. oversimplifying? Or? No, well, it, it is simple, but that's a nice way to differentiate it, I think. Today I'm joined by Anna Simmons, who is a clinical psychologist, and we're going to be talking about strategies for coping with emotional stress uh, and things all related to anxiety, depression and so on. Great to have you with us. Thank you for having me. Oh, and we know each other quite well because you've helped friends of mine out. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Anna has a professional service at helping people, um, and uh, you'll find all the details down below. Where shall we start? I want to start, I think, by saying, where do we cross the line between sort of just emotional distress and when does it become clinical? And I need to know that professionally because obviously as a health coach, there are certain boundaries. So if somebody's got emotional problems, we can get involved. But once it becomes sort of, sort of a more severe and, and sort of mental, mentally unwell, then we, as health coaches, we have to step out. So where do we draw the, bar sort of the boundaries and, or are there any boundaries or...? Well, I suppose I like to think of mental health as almost a spectrum. So if we start with sort of emotional health on one side, which is the stuff that we all feel and experience. So we all get worried, we all get stressed, we all feel low when life happens to us, um, into sort of more complex mental health at the other end. So perhaps, you know, you sort of real psychotic episodes or real sort of personality difficulties. So I think it's because it's a spectrum, it's hard to say at this point, this changes or this shifts. But I think if you're mindful of, um, of the contrast between those two ends of the spectrum that certainly helps because we do all experience anxiety we all do experience times where we feel less perhaps vibrant and a bit flatter and lower and i would say that's usually because we're responding in a very normal way to things that are happening to us or around us or actually things that are happening inside of us how we appraise and make sense of those events when something becomes clinical so perhaps a clinical depression or anxiety we obviously have diagnostic criteria for those so for example um, if you had felt very depressed for two weeks that mm -hmm. would be something that we could then diagnose and it kind of pervades every area of your life there's no perhaps with depression there's no places where you feel hopeful you're at work and you still feel the same as you do when you're at home things like not being able to sleep changes in appetite those sorts of things so I suppose as someone who's a health coach or even if you're just a partner or a friend it's looking out for patterns of behavior and, and presentations that just don't seem to go away you know and yeah. I would say that's the more kind of clinical end something that really impacts your day-to-day -day living and your quality of life and functioning are these issues on the rise or are we just becoming more aware of it? Because I know you're getting busier mm. and busier and it's in the news a lot more and mm. uh, in, in, in the corporation that we, we, we run, you know, it's the topic of conversation. Probably more around mental health than even, you know, physical well-being, you know. Uh, mm. and, and yet when you look at the statistics, you know, more people have uh, mobility issues at work, they have physical issues at work and so on and mm. so forth. But the one we all keep talking about at the moment is mental wellness, is it on the rise or are we just getting more aware of it? I think we're probably more aware of it. And, and you know, I have to say, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. Yes, of course, it's very difficult when people that we love and ourselves are struggling with our mental health. But the fact that we talk about it, generations ago, this wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. You know, if we were raised by parents who were just born sort of around the, the war or whatever, they wouldn't have had parents who were always necessarily emotionally responsive to them because they were surviving. So actually, if we are coming to to be able to say about ourselves, I am really struggling here, or I think my child is struggling. That's brilliant because I think past generations have perhaps held on to that and not expressed it. So it is really hard to know if, you know, perhaps it's on the rise or whether we are just better at, at recognising it and talking about it. I think probably, you know, psychology came out of the Second World War in a lot of ways. Okay, we had Freud and various other people, but really constructive clinical psychology came out of that. What are we going to do to help people who've got, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder and complex PTSD? So we learned to sort of think, okay, let's look at these people and how we're going to help them with the research. So I think we've got much better at identifying in ourselves and losing perhaps the shame and the stigma mm -hmm. around mental health. I think that that is definitely still present in some cultures 
cultures. But the fact, like I said, we're talking about it in the workplace and perhaps you can go to your boss and say, you know what, I am really struggling, my anxiety and stress levels are high without that shame um, and know that there's ways to help you as well and to help yourself. So it's definitely better that this is out there. I think what we do with it is a different story. So do we feel able to get the help? I think there's still probably stigma around there. But, you know, perhaps it, the fact that it's out there in social media, you can put into Instagram anxiety and lots yeah. of things will come up that could possibly help you, maybe not so much as well, but it's more accessible and that can only be a good thing. I always get sort of told off for oversimplifying things and uh, am I ever simplifying it I just want to quickly get a, a distinction between anxiety impression and depression. Mm. Anxiety is more people thinking about the future. Depression is more thinking about the past. That's a nice way is to that, look at it. Is that yeah. oversimplifying? Or? No, well, it, it is simple, but that's a nice way to differentiate it, I think. Yeah, anxiety is characterised really by a feeling of unsafety in yourself, in the world, absolutely doing a lot of what if thinking. So what if this happens? What if that happens? Rather than we know the secret to sort of happiness or one of the secrets is to be very much in the present moment. So focusing on what is happening now, not what if something is going to happen. Depression is characterised by thoughts of sort of hopelessness and usually taps into feelings of not feeling good enough. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't feel there's much hope for the future. And actually, there's probably a set of core beliefs in somebody who's depressed, who just you know sees the world very negatively, doesn't like themselves very much. And but I think what underpins all of it essentially is trauma, and that we have all experienced trauma to a certain degree, whether that's a horrific trauma, whether it's abuse, or whether it's what we call a small t trauma. So well, well, the capital T, small yeah. little t, yeah. things that you know perhaps you went through a parental separation that wasn't handled very well. Perhaps you were bullied. You know, so we're not mm -hmm. talking the more severe end of trauma, but really still significant. And what we know about trauma is it's not the things that happened to you, but it's how you've responded to them inside yes. you. Yeah. So I would say most psychological conditions come down to sort of trauma if you want to make it really sort of simple and then how we respond obviously is a different is a different matter i think you almost touched on strategy one then <laughs> which is living in the now because i know a lot of Absolutely. people that you've helped have said to me well and i've talked about this out there and it's very much i know one of those strategies is yeah don't try and live too much in the past don't worry too much about the future what you're breathing like right now how you're feeling right this very moment Mm. Expand on that for me, because I think that's strategy number one. Well, it is. I think, yeah, I th and there's a pre-strategy to that, I would say, which is acknowledging that this is happening. So if you're able to sort of say, I'm anxious, and you can catch yourself before you spiral into kind of panic, or if you're, you know, before you get really sort of in a place where you can't get clarity on your thoughts. I appreciate sometimes anxiety, the onset can be very, very quick. But if you can grab it, and sometimes this is a secret, getting the bit between the thoughts. We have 80,000 thoughts a day. It's a huge amount of thoughts. I don't know how they record that, but that's <laughs> what, what, it, what it is. So you're trying to get that's the, the bit between ones. the thoughts. Yeah, exactly. We have exactly. 80,000 unconscious ones of which are something like high percent about what food we're going to eat and things about in lifestyle, yeah, but there we go. Yeah, I yeah. can imagine. Yeah. So it's really about acknowledging that this is your experience in the moment. And then sort of you can get hold of that thought and you can go, okay, what am I actually worried about? Because sometimes we have to remember that thoughts aren't always conscious as well, like you've just said. So you might, you have to sometimes really dig out what the anxiety is about. So I might have a client who's anxious about, you know, a bit of a basic example, but getting on a plane. Well, what is it exactly? Are you worried about the takeoff? Are you worried about the landing? Are you what? what, what you, the captain's going to have a heart attack. What exactly are you worried about? So really, and it sounds simple, but we don't. We so sometimes when we're stressed or anxious, we don't actually know what we're thinking. So stopping yourself, maybe just taking a breath, and go, okay, what am I thinking? What is driving this right now? And then getting that thought and saying, okay, well, what's the chances of that happening out of a hundred percent? You know, what are the chances of that happening? And if it's going to happen, if there's a high chance, well, what's my plan? Yeah, so rather than yeah. this out of control, what if it happens, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Stopping yourself and go, okay, but okay, if there's a real chance, what this is going to happen, what's my plan? So you can just feel in control because anxiety is all about feeling out of control and mm -hmm. not feeling you can get a grip on the thoughts and usually lots of florid thoughts really quick and it's not just about the one thing about getting on the plane, it's probably everything else, you know, the social yeah. anxiety, if I panic on the plane, how's that going to look? It all kind of feeds into each other, but really trying to slow the thoughts down by acknowledging what's going on for you. I think then once you've tried to challenge it and reframe it with a what's the chances and you know, you've got some, you know, thinking about what do I need? So if you can get ahead of something, if you think, right, I have got this really awful 
situation, I've got to deal with this really difficult conversation or I've got to go and have an injection and it makes me procedure and I'm anxious. Well, stay a step ahead. What do you need to do before, you know, do you need to take someone into the hospital with you? Do you know, do you need to have something to help you before you get on the plane or whatever it might be? Do you need to send your boss a quick debrief of what you want to talk about before you go into the meeting? So again, it's kind of really mm -hmm. trying to take control before your anxiety takes control of you. And ultimately, of course, it's going to. There's going to be times where you feel very out of control and you can't manage it. But just taking a breath and slowing yourself down and then just being very kind to yourself. Like, it's okay that I feel this and I'm going to be okay. I'm supported, hopefully, by people to talk to or I've got this. You know, the feeling of unsafety is, is a really yeah. difficult one in anxiety. Yeah. And those things can help us just feel a bit more safe, I think, internally. I'm going to give, I'm going to do strategy number two. So what I learned years and years and years ago, that fear is mm. an acronym oh. for false expectations appearing real. Mm, I like it. Yeah. So if you think, oh, well, I'm fearful of that, I'm worried about getting on the plane or mm. I'm worried about giving that speech to these people or mm. seeing my manager. False expectations appearing real. In other words, they feel real, real, they feel real, but it's just a false expectation. Yeah, but almost, the brain will almost tell you that that is definitely what's happening. You believe it, don't you? Oh, That's yeah, the thing, yeah, you yeah. run the scenario yeah. in your head to such an extent that it becomes so real. So again, having to almost, we know, with thoughts, it's always really important to kind of observe them and observe your thinking. We get so into it, like that example, kind of, I'm, I'm in it, I'm giving the speech and it's all going wrong and everything and I'm losing my words. But actually, if we can step back and go, those are just thoughts. I imagine my thoughts are kind of conveyor belt and I just let them go. And, and the things that really do need addressing, I'll take them off the conveyor belt and I will sort them out. But there's a lot of those 80,000 thoughts that we can just let go. And we can say to ourselves, okay, that scenario that I'm running in my head, is that how I want it to go? And actually, you can then generate a scenario that goes really well. What if you imagine the speech going really well and, mm. and people going, fantastic, really yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. And running that scenario yeah. as well is really important. We use that in EMDR therapy, eye movement, EM. eye movement desensitization reprocessing. Okay. So say, for example, you've had a car accident, you're anxious about getting in the car and you think, well, I'm going to get in the car and I'm going to go into somebody. Actually, envisaging that going really well. You know, we'd love to do bilateral stimulation tapping, which helps sort of pro put the process in the right place in the brain. But there's a lot of power to visualising something going well because the brain can then also believe that is true rather yeah. than something false being true, as you said. That's so true. I remember skiing once with my uncle, my uncle Dave, and uh, he's, he was like a Frank Spencer. You know, if it was going to go wrong, <laughs> it would go wrong for Uncle Dave. Mm. And we came around, late afternoon, we came around this corner at, at the top of the ski mountain, and there was about 30 young children, about 200 metres down the mountain, all with their skis, with the teacher leading them, all with the bibs on, with their numbers on. Mm. And I looked at Dave, Dangerous Dave, Uncle Dave, and I said, Dave, don't hit the kids, don't hit the kids, don't hit the kids. And we went skiing down, he took them all out. And we were there for like an hour. Luckily, nobody got hurt. But we were there an hour putting their skis back on. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh and that night, I realised what I should have said was, Dave, go left, go left, go left, go left. Mm. Because he was focused on the kids, the kids, the kids, because that's why I kept yeah. screaming at him. Yeah. Whereas yeah. if I said, go left, go left, go left, or go right, go right, go right, mm. he probably wouldn't have hit them. So we tend to, because you know, we, 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 we're focusing on it, it tends to happen. Absolutely. Yeah. And I was listening to um, a lady called Marie Forleo who does lots of, sort of business things and she was saying a really good strategy rather than say don't do this is say I'm not available for this. So don't say don't have that chocolate cake or don't have that glass of wine. Say I'm just not available for chocolate cake. I'm not. And, and actually it sounds very subtle but just sort of saying this is not even on my radar right now. This isn't something that because if you say don't mm. one of the things I say to my clients is if I say to you don't think about pink elephants for one minute what's going to happen when well, you're already exactly. imagining kind of pink elephants floating around. So when we try not to think about something we think about it even more you're absolutely right so it is yeah. about sort of trying to get that awareness of the thoughts again so we can just do a bit of shifting yeah. into a different direction on purpose and sometimes that feels like we're tricking ourselves and and sometimes it feels like oh what am I trying to manipulate here but actually the brain will go with it yeah. if you implant something it will kind of and if it's especially if it's a positive thing mm -hmm. it will want to go with it a bit more anyway so you you know you're better off putting in equal scenarios aren't you a negative absolutely. one and a positive one and yeah. hoping that the brain and some people's brains of course will latch on to a more negative appraisal but if we just put the positive in there's a chance the brain might go oh well, maybe i'll just try it yeah. and we'll just see so it's definitely worth doing well we do that a lot with uh helping people with obesity and, and mm. turn around their obesity when they've obviously got to change their eating habits and rather than say i'm giving up cream cakes or i'm giving mm. up the crisps say i'm escaping because they're all made by corporates so you know <laughs> we make them hate 
the McDonald's company, and we hate them, make them hate Nestle and, and so on. We tell them about all the chemicals they're putting in and we explain to them that natural strawberry flavour could have come from the gland of a beaver's bottom. I try and get that on in every single podcast because that really, really annoys me. <laughs> Gosh. They call it natural, when you, with your kids, and you see natural sto- strawberry flavour, it is natural because it came from, from the, not, but not from a strawberry. That's crazy. Yeah, how about that? So yeah. we make them hate the big corporates. And then we say, well, so don't think you're giving up your Walker's crisps, you're escaping That's the secret. them. Yeah. No, like you say, it Absolutely. doesn't work for everybody, but if you can mm. trick your brain like that, you yeah. know, it really, really works. Because what you're doing is putting a different narrative, a different story around it. Yeah. I think when you're giving up something as well, there's a lot to be said for saying, say if you want to give up cigarettes or something, or perhaps that's more of a physical addiction, but cake or sugar or whatever, it's just saying, I'm just not gonna do that today, or yeah. for this hour, I'm just not gonna have a coffee this morning. And actually, we need to feel in control. If, you, if somebody took something I loved completely away from me, I would want it even more, you yep. know? So if you just go for now, that's just not, I'm just not available for that. I'm just not having that for today. You don't yep. have to worry, like we're saying, there's no value in future worry, is there? Yep. But just right now in this moment, I'm making a choice not to have that. And what happens yep. in an hour? I don't know, we'll see. Yep. But you can then hopefully apply the same principle to that there because you've got a reward from it you felt good about yourself you've had a physical dopamine hit of reward yeah. i feel good for not having the thing rather than good for having the sugar hopefully the reward could come from that yeah well when you keep telling yourself i can't have it i can't have it i can't have it what eventually happens most of the time not all the time not for all people mm. and different addictions stroke i don't know love affairs with different foods and things the more you keep saying i can't have it i can't have it I can't mm. have it the day you do have it the brain then, dopamine goes off and goes, ah, oh, I've been waiting for this for, this for ages. Mm-hmm. And now you eat, you know, you, you bought that family pack of nuts and you're only going to have a few. And, but then it's like, what I call it, like a, a priming effect. You've primed it and because you've been suppressing the, the desire for it or trying to suppress it and it was still there, you end up having more of it and it gets worse. You no, know, that makes sense, doesn't it? And then you feel awful about yourself. Yeah. So you think, well, I might as well just have the whole bag. And I think we know women are typically worse than this, so uh, at this. So if you think, well, I'm going to eat healthily today, and by 11 o'clock you've had a couple of digestives, women are more likely to go, well, that's the day written off, I'm not, I don't know why there's a gender difference, but we know that's the case, rather than just going, you know what, I just forgive myself, it doesn't matter. Like, what's important now is that I have a nice lunch and that I don't have any more biscuits later, but we're so much harder on ourselves. Mm-hmm. And actually, just forgiving ourselves if we do get off track, you know, because none of us are perfect, are we? And life is tricky. So I think self-forgiveness and talking to yourself really kindly and being your own coach really yeah. is so crucial in all of this as well. Is that um, a strategy number three, being kind to yourself? Absolutely, self-compassion is really important. So whether you're feeling anxious or low, sort of almost forgiving yourself and just being like, it's okay that I feel like this. It's not what I would choose, but you know what, maybe I'm doing my best. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe I'm just reacting to circumstances in life that are really hard. It doesn't mean that I've got a mental health condition. I'm having a normal human emotional response to things. You think about with kids, you know, how often do you see a kid fall over and a parent will go, oh, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. Well, they're not fine. They <laughs> hurt. And it's okay to say to a child, that yeah. looks really sore. I'm so sorry that happened. Yeah. You know, that. So if you can do it for a child, you can hopefully do it for yourself. So sometimes we have to almost talk to ourselves like we're children, yeah. you know, and kind of go, that's okay, like give permission, yeah. it's okay to hurt right now, like this is gonna be okay, I'm gonna make this better for you. And sort of really trying to be kind to ourselves. I think we all have a, an inner parent and sometimes that can be quite a critical voice that comes in. Um, and we need to counteract that. So I shouldn't be anxious, I should be at work today. It's awful that I'm sat on the sofa and I can't do this thing. I really wanted to be there and present. Well, that doesn't get you anywhere, does it? Mm-hmm. All that gets you to places where I feel terrible about myself, I feel like I've let all my colleagues down, I'm not good enough. Whereas if you just go, you know what, I just need to heal today and today is a healing day and I just need to take it easy and then I'll be okay. I'll replenish myself and I'll, and I'll be okay. That's a much nicer, gentler way. But if you find it hard to do that to yourself, just think, how would you talk to a child Sure. Yeah. in that scenario? And then yeah. you can hopefully apply that back to yourself. In fact, that brings me on nicely. Um, so, you know, being hard on ourselves is social media making this work? You know, I've got a, a view, it might be right, might be wrong, but most social media, people only put their best image, portray their best image themselves. You know, they don't post when they're getting up in the morning with their hair's a mess. You know, lads are posting themselves in the gym, ladies all made up and so on. And then that comparison starts to kick in. Is that one of the reasons why today we put, there's more emotional distress? Because we're comparing ourselves to the so what we believe is everybody else's lives. It certainly doesn't help, does it? I don't think. And I, I particularly work with young people, um, and they are just 
bombarded they think it's real you have to give an alternative and say yeah this isn't you know it's not real life because you look at that and go that's not you in the morning that you make upon but they don't necessarily hold that in mind so it, it definitely doesn't help and I think one of my advice my part of my advice would be if you're not feeling great about yourself try and avoid those you know if Mother's Day for example is hard for you and you see everybody else with their mums having a great time but actually you have a really difficult relationship with your mum please don't go on Instagram and Facebook that day because there's no way you're going to feel better about yourself you're just going to feel a sense of grief or trigger whatever is difficult for you so social media I and mean, obviously it has its benefits as we said earlier you know you can google something on Instagram look for something on Instagram and you can find you know or oh, there's someone who feels the same as I do there's a useful quote here's some advice here's a Real. So it ha definitely has its place, but it is the difficult w difficulty with comparison that I think where it falls down, definitely. Do you subscribe to comparison is a theft of happiness? I would subscribe to that, yeah, because actually... So that as a strategy. Yeah. <laughs> strategy number four. <laughs> no, well, absolutely. And what, I guess the question is then, what can you do to sort of counteract that? Yeah. And no two people's experiences in life are the same, aren't they? When we talk yeah. about the small T trauma that we have all had to a certain degree, um, your trauma is going to be different to somebody else's. Your upbringing is going to be different. Your genetics and your predisposition is going to be different. So you could show two people a post on social media and they can have very different reactions to it according to their self-worth, their how good they feel about themselves, their experiences of other people. So how we appraise things, which is, I guess, the thoughts that we choose, um, consciously and unconsciously, is incredibly important. So I think, yeah, absolutely, it's about, it's about the appraisal of that thing in front of you that's most crucial. So you could look at somebody and you could think, oh, I'm jealous of them or whatever, or I wish I was more like them. Okay, well, why don't you look at that then and say... I'm going to have a bit of that then. So rather than be unhappy for, they might see a picture of a loving couple and rather than be sort of like, I wish I had that, go, that's so lovely for them. I'm going to make sure I get a bit of that. So I think yeah. you, you, you've just got to be very consciously aware. And of course, with social media, we unconsciously scroll, scroll, scroll and we're picking up these messages all the time. Whereas actually, if we, we sort of be more conscious about what we're accessing and probably restrict ourselves a little bit because you know you get these screen reminders don't you say you've spent four hours a day on your yeah. phone or more you know and you think what on yeah. and actually yeah. if you were to say right I'm not going to go on it all day I'm just going to go on it or on my lunch break or in the evening you could actually use your time so much more productively on other things so my advice would be is if you're struggling with your mental health it might not be the best place to be trying to feel good about yourself what about so we've talked about some strategies and we've talked about you know, past experiences that may be influencing things. Um, you knew you weren't going to get away with that questions around nutrition. Um, <laughs> what's your view on the importance of nutrition on emotional wellness? Well, I think we probably don't discuss it enough. Even as clinicians, I'm going to hold my hands up and say, not for my for my my colleagues, but particularly, but don't think we're we're sort of necessarily very well trained to ask that. We might ask somebody, do you smoke? Do you drink? How do you sleep? That sort of thing. But I don't think we'd be saying, what do you generally eat in a day? I'm sure some some clinicians do, but it probably isn't something that comes to the forefront of our minds. I think it's seeping in more slowly and we're aware of that perhaps because I work with children as well that would be something that I might ask um, or particularly someone's you know presented with binge eating disorder we know yeah. that's affected yeah. very much by blood sugars and things like that so yeah. that would be more relevant um, but I think it's probably something we don't pay enough attention to and that we really do need to yeah. and I think that's really about building awareness of how the body works we think the brain is a big metabolic organ isn't it and it yeah. feeds everything else I mean we know that 90% of serotonin is produced in the gut but how often yeah. do we talk about gut health yeah. and the impact on mood probably not very often a very good point. and of course it's cyclical because usually if we feel a bit rubbish we want the junk food we want the carbs for that pickup we want the sugar but of course we're not helping our serotonin which is the you know the chemical that can help us with our mood so I think if people knew those things we all know to eat properly and well but why what's the yeah. impact on our mood you know I think probably people would do things differently if they actually knew the impact yeah it's, it's fascinating isn't it because I, as you know I spent a lot of time in the Maasai a lot of time in Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Madagascar, all these countries. Mm. And I get, get out with the tribes people and we're out camping with them and we're there for, for quite a long time. And, and I've, I've never had a conversation about, by the way, uh, mm. depression, anxiety, but I have had conversations with them about suicide. And they have no idea of the concept. They have really? absolutely no, why would somebody do that? They, they, they don't even know what, no, they don't know what the word means. They can't get their head round mm. why anybody would ever commit suicide. Now, of course, I'm not saying, that mental illness always leads to that, but I'm just saying that that kind of interwoven in some senses. But but therefore, I wonder if how much food does play a part. 
I wonder if their lives are more, you know, everybody in the same village is more similar, whereas ours, mm -hmm. and of course they don't compare as much there. But I guess diet, lifestyle, um, that comparison, theft of happiness and so on, there must be something in it. There must be something in it. Absolutely. And also cultural sort of reasoning and understanding as well. You know, in that certain cultures, suicide would be very... You, you just can't do that because of particular yeah. religious region, reasons. Um, and, I mean, if you look at countries like the Mediterranean, Japan and Finland and stuff, they have better rates of mental health than we do because they yeah. have also have better diets, don't they, as well? Yeah. And I'm not saying there's a cause and effect necessarily there, but there, there must be some pattern from you're eating less processed food, things that are better for your brain and your heart and your, and your gut, and so their mental health could be better. I imagine it's multi-layered with lots of different things, generational patterns, those sorts of things, mental health support that they have access to, the culture of, you know, I mean, it's very stereotypical, but typically a British culture wouldn't be as we were saying before like probably 50 years ago let's talk about how you feel you might mm -hmm. have found that in a bottle of whiskey so you know there are other cultures that are better at talking about feelings than we are I'm not sure about African cultures in all honesty yeah. um, but per perhaps transparency of communication and how you feel might be a factor in those things as well yeah good point so I've put a few strategies in your head let's have a few more of you <laughs> that was a bit naughty of me <laughs> <laughs> in response to anything particular or uh, just, just dealing with will... em dealing with emotional problems so that they don't become more clinical so they, they you know they, they don't become as we said earlier on you know that, that crossover between emotion emotional health and, and mental health yeah you know, getting it early what are some of the strategies people can can put into place. Well, you're right, it is prevention, isn't it? So yeah. I was talking about awareness, which is obviously important. I think, you know I'm going to say this, talking is obviously really, really important. I think, you know, let's not be under any illusion that NHS mental health services are not under pressure. They absolutely are. But you don't have to be having, obviously, seek professional support when you need it. But having a group of friends or just one friend you can talk to is really important. We know why suicide rates are higher in sort of middle-aged men. It's the restriction of the social group and not actually, or not necessarily the group, but having particular people they can mm -hmm. talk to. So many of my clients, male clients, I've never talked to anybody about this before. Nobody knows this about me. Would you hear that less often from women? I think, I hate to gender stereotype but when we do tend to talk about things a lot more so just talking about things because when you hold on to something in your head you can warp it can't you you can yeah. get yourself thoughts yeah. are interesting you can go from a to b to z yeah. before you've even noticed you're at z like a fishing reel has just gone up and i'm picking out a random thought from my first few thoughts so reeling that back in again like i said slowing yourself down and maybe talking to somebody i mean i have that experience i can think something and i'll talk to a friend and they'll go that's not how i see it like i think this is happening and i'm like oh yeah so just putting in that alternative uh, uh, and somebody who's actually believing and validating your yeah. thoughts and feelings as well because if you feel full of self-doubt and I sh guilt I shouldn't be feeling this and I don't understand this talking to somebody who's not necessarily a professional they might be able to support you in that really yeah. because the reality is we're all human and we all feel these emotions you know we all get angry we all get sad we'll feel guilty we get embarrassed we're no different in that we all feel the realm of feelings but we don't necessarily talk about them I think there's something um, about kind of how we communicate with children at a young age that it's not normal to be happy all the time and yeah. it is okay to be angry and we shouldn't really tell children off for being angry how they express it might need some shaping, but allowing children to express themselves. I hope we're getting better at that. So talking to close friends, family. And in fact, you've answered a question there because I can't remember the exact numbers, but it's something like eight out of 10 suicides are male. Mm. Uh, it might even be nine out of 10. And I've always thought, on the female side here, um, we're not the ones that have had, you know, painful periods for years, we're not the ones that have had to go through child labour, we haven't got perimenopausal, then we haven't got to deal with the menopause, we don't get hot flushes at night, and and, 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 and yet we're the ones that are, are, are committing suicide way more. It could be as simple as, well, I don't want to again oversimplify anything, because it's, you know, it's obviously a, a, something you can't oversimplify, but it could be a major part that we just don't talk, we don't it open up. It is a major up. component, yeah. absolutely. And that's the safety of relationships, that men sometimes have this, I've got to be the provider, I've got to be the one that holds it together in this family. And if your father was particularly like that, did, you know, did your father talk to you about feelings? Did you see a man model good feelings and emotional management? Maybe not, maybe you did see him drink, maybe you saw him get angry, maybe you saw him push everything down. So what's your model as a man that, you know, or if you're watching this and you have a male partner, what's, how do you see them? 
them managing their feelings because your children will certainly learn that from them. And thinking about younger children and sort of really trying to raise resilient children, when we teach children how to manage their emotions and it's okay to feel angry or whatever, how many of us were raised to be good children? You've got to be good and we still do that probably within schools, don't we? Yeah. Sit quietly or you're a good girl, you're not because you express your emotion and you're overexcited, you know. Um, is that we really need to teach them how to express emotions in a good way and that it's safe to do that. But I think we, as a generation who are parenting now, I think we are better at that. And some people will say to me, why adolescents in such a mess? Why are they experiencing all this stuff and they can't manage it? Well, you know what? They are the ones who are coming in, and we've shaped them to be like this, who are actually showing us their feelings. How amazing is that? Yeah. That you've got young people yeah. who say, I am anxious, and it, it's manifesting like this, or I can't concentrate in a lesson because I'm low. Because we have actually maybe taught them off the back of our own experiences that might not have been so positive of how we can express our emotions, that they can actually do that, and it's safe to do that. And then they can sort yeah. them out rather than sit and hold it in. You know, and you and I were talking about the impact of holding emotions in on the physical body earlier, mm -hmm. you know, and then we get into all sort of health problems because we're holding emotion in and it makes us physically ill. Brilliant. Fantastic. How about as a strategy, do you ever talk about breathing techniques uh, at moments of stress with, with your clients? Yeah, absolutely. There's lots of different types. Show it. We yeah. Box breathing I use with, with small children. Imagine taking four, draw a square, four breaths in, hold for four, release for four and hold for four. Because actually, I mean, it's a nice distraction, isn't it? But also getting all that nice oxygen into your body is very calming on the system, especially when you're in fight or flight, which is the mm -hmm. mechanism we use to keep us safe when we're anxious. Um, that can be fantastic just to allow people to feel in control. In fact, talking of fight or flight, of course, when you're in fight and flight, the parasympathetic nerve kicks out loads of cortisol, putting mm. sugar back into the, to the bloodstream. Uh, again, is that the sort of trying to get more relaxed through the breathing? Because we know when you do a lot of breathing techniques, especially in through the nose and out through the nose, mm. that you can sort of push down the adrenaline, push down cortisol. Uh, is that, for certain people, in that moment of, of anxiety, just you know, taking five minutes out from work or watching the TV to just sit in a dark room and just breathe and be conscious of your breathing and, and trying to let go of, of, of certain things. Is that part of uh, dealing with emotional stress? Yeah, absolutely, because your amygdala is kind of firing up at the back of your brain, fight or flight, I mean, which is basically the switch that says there are threats here and these are life or death threats. When you know it's not, you know, you've got your tax bill through and you, you know, it's not life or death, but it might be pretty stressful or awful for you. Um, so you have to sort of say to your brain, nothing bad is happening right now. I mean, of course, if you're in a car accident or some life or death situation, you need that to be working for you. That's definitely a good thing. That's what it's for. But the problem with, with stress and anxiety is we kick in that mechanism when it's not quite needed. Yeah. And we have to just gently say to ourselves, nothing bad is happening right now. And the breath helps us to come back into that present moment of just going, everything's all right. And I often add in a, I am safe with that for people. So breathing, saying, I'm safe. I'm safe. Everything's okay. Maybe a bilateral stimulation, which is sort of tapping, you know, like a calming bilateral movement, um, because it does help to, to reduce all that adrenaline cortisol that your body's firing out, because it then doesn't know what to do with it, does it? And That's you just right. mentioned, I didn't know about the sugar component, but it does obviously yeah. lots of different things that probably aren't very helpful for the body. Well, the brain doesn't know the difference between sort of chronic stress, so mm. from anxiety and depression over a long period of time, and acute stress. It just is stress to the brain. because. Mm. You know, in history, the, the stress was the mammal was chasing you, um, and, and therefore you needed energy. Well, to get instant energy, you've got to turn body fat back into sugar, so you've mm. got maximum sugar in the bloodstream. But we also know that more than a couple of teaspoons of sugar in the entire 60,000 miles I learned the other day of blood vessels uh, and capillaries, you know, only supposed to have two teaspoons of sugar. But because of that stress, you know, the, 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 because we need to run away from the lion or the thing that's chasing us, we pump so much sugar back in, but it's only supposed to be there for a few seconds. Mm. And then instantly, once the lion's gone or the mammal's gone, pushes it back into the body fat. Mm. Um, but of course, if you've got elevated stress over a long time, you're constantly putting sugar back in, in, into the bloodstream, which has all those knock-on effects. So mm. the, the breathing techniques, yeah, absolutely, I believe 100% can help uh, in, in that area. And, and you talked earlier on about the, the importance of oxygen. What, how do you rate the importance of getting outdoor more. I saw a st stat the other day that we are now indoors more in Britain than at any time in human history spending indoors compared to being outdoors. 
are you a big fan of getting your clients outdoors in the fresh air walking oh absolutely i mean it changes your thoughts doesn't it you know if you've just read some difficult emails and you've got to deal with the nine but you take yourself out and you almost a very make your brain compartmentalize it and say well i can't do anything with that email or this scenario now or the argument that's happening at home I'm just going to go and walk and be very mindful when you walk and so mindfulness again back to the present moment but just looking at a leaf on a tree it sounds daffy you can keep walking you don't have to stand at the park and kind of stare at things but just be appreciating things around you the brain can't focus on lots and lots of things at once so when you're just focusing on something very still and calm the impact of that is that it will make you still and calm and of course it'll say oxygen through the body feeling your feet firmly on the ground makes us feel sort of safe as well so mindfully walking you know at mm -hmm. lunch time I often walk purposefully to get some lunch through the park without my phone and just to take everything in you know watching things appreciating what's around me is hugely important but it does also change your thoughts as well so very important we can all get so micro focused can't we mm -hmm. like we do on the phone with social media you know this is my world and actually we have to look up and take in take in the world around us to broaden our thoughts so we can purposely change our thoughts by doing that i think that's great advice. And don't forget, uh, look down below because you can find all of Anna's details, all of her social handles. If you're enjoying the conversation, uh, we're going to have a lot more sit downs over the coming months. Uh, so do please, I think the word is subscribe. In fact, I know the word is subscribe. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, I watch my children watching all these kids things and every other word is please subscribe, please subscribe. But if you can subscribe, that will help us to get the word out uh, about, we're all about prevention, we're about preventative uh, healthcare about prevention in terms of lifestyle, prevention in terms of diet, and uh, and it's been fascinating. Come on, let's have one or two more strategies for dealing with. Let's say somebody is very early on. So we've got emotional mm -hmm. stress moving more sort of clinically then uh, in, into into mental issue, mental health. But early on, let's say you're just starting to realise that. So at first, it must take ages to realise what's happening. You know, it would be great if straight away you go, oh, this is, ang mm. uh, this is anxiety or this is a little bit of depression coming on. I bet many, many people, you know, if they could identify early, might even be able to pinpoint easy what it is. Mm. But probably it takes a, a, you know, maybe if you spot it too late yourself, then it becomes more difficult. But early on, what's, what's the, what are the, or are we going to mainly summarise the things we've already touched on, do you think? I think what we touched on is useful. I think a lot of us are very averse to sitting in our emotional pain. We don't like to see it in our kids and we're not great at tolerating it ourselves. This is why people do turn to alcohol and addictions of any kind of nature. So if you catch yourself, we're talking about prevention, but if you do catch yourself drinking too much or you think I am working at a level that is not sustainable, we're in a bit of a burnout culture, aren't we, sadly, mm -hmm. where, which suggests that we're not picking up those early signs, that we are working, 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 and not necessarily work job, but I mean the stress of the house, the kids, the dogs, everything else. Um, and we get to a point where we go, I can't move or I can't get up or I really, it, it might be, the key to it might be some thoughts like, I really don't want to do this today or I really need to change something. So, it, so if you're at that point where you're quite advanced with it you do have time to t turn it back but it's harder so getting in there obviously is is the key to this so again like I was said awareness of your thoughts but in terms of emotional distress just knowing that when pain comes along it's like waves you know it comes up it hits a bit of a peak and it's really painful and difficult and then it comes down again what a lot of people do is they feel the emotional pain coming and rather than ride with it imagine you're on a surfboard i would draw it yeah. badly but one of my clients <laughs> on a surfboard and if you're kind of riding it a lot of people get off at that point so it climbs it and they get off so that's what how the ocd mechanism ocd works obsessive compulsive disorder but it's also things like addiction so i don't want to feel this pain so i'm going to numb it i don't want to feel this i'm going to do you know so it's not helpful because then we reinforce that part and become yeah. cyclical so if we actually just don't fear emotional pain and if we don't fear our children experiencing it our job as parents is to ride out emotional pain with children we all want um do you think we tend to overall try and suppress it oh stop well say don't worry about that don't worry about that yeah. or whatever yeah i think it's really easy to do that and when you're I tired think I'm and you're i think i'm guilty of that yeah well me yeah. too you yeah. know because you know sometimes it's not the moment you feel like i can't go into this now i'm about to <laughs> you know i've got a train to catch or whatever or you've got to get to school but actually when our kids are experiencing emotional pain sometimes that can trigger something in us so if, if your kid is saying i'm really struggling with this i feel very upset about this it may if you can't handle it it's worth looking at yourself and going 
what's my experience of being supported through emotional pain or what can I do? So what I'm saying is one of the strategies is, and it's not an easy one, I guess, but just learning how to ride out your own emotional pain. And one of those things is allowing this wave, it will naturally come down, trust me. It will come down and you have to let it ride. And it will be using the, some of the strategies we've talked about, but also remembering that no feeling lasts forever. Think about the time you were, last time you were really happy. Well, sadly, yeah. that probably didn't last forever. No feelings last forever. The wave doesn't go up and then stay, it comes down. So reminding yourself that this feeling will come down this is there is going to be an outcome to this a solution to this hopefully and I think if we can t tolerate that in ourselves and we can teach our kids that knowing that emotional pain is one of our greatest teachers none of us grow or develop without it we cannot we wish for our kids to have a happy simple life where nothing bad happens to them well if you want a kid who's humble and wise and empathic and compassionate and contributes to society the way they get there is through pain I'm afraid so and growth and That's development so not such. being scared of ourselves to experience pain you know we've experienced all of us have experienced pain everyone watching this we've right. experienced pain but we're still here aren't we and yeah. good days bad days I mean you said earlier on that we're actually more open to talk than previous generations that's the good bit mm. but I bet the, the not so good bit is we're so, and I'm very guilty of this, certainly my youngest child, Cottonwool, you know, it's yeah. like anything you want you get. Whereas I know my older children, I was much more, uh, you know, uh, just very different. But I think, mm. yeah, we, oh, yeah. Because we're that's parental instinct, we're trying, isn't it? Trying to suppress it, I think. Yeah, and, but it's and, normal as well, isn't yeah. it? Because you want you brought these children to the world, and you want to protect them. Of course, you do. Be a terrible parent, like I'll push you out in front of cars or whatever. You know, it's our job to keep these children safe. But then something can get triggered in us when we actually see discomfort in them. But what I would say is, if that happens to you, or you struggle to see discomfort in other people, and it triggers you, what is that about you? There's something in you that might struggle to manage emotional pain. And there's no answer to managing emotional pain. We've got all these strategies and things; they will help. But ultimately, just allow your feelings to move through you and don't be scared of them. Yeah. They're normal. They're normal. And maybe you are a guy watching this and you haven't got friends who will talk about how they feel, you know, depressed or whatever, but you're not the only one. Don't be scared to allow the feelings in. That's how we move them through and that's how we process them so that they don't stick with us. And is that back to a point you made earlier? Keep reminding yourself. How am I right this moment? Am I safe this moment? Yeah, nothing and bad's happening right now. now. This is okay. Yeah. And, and I've got all the resources in me. Like I will say yeah. to my children, okay, this is really difficult and I see the pain in you, but I know that you are stronger than the pain. And so when we were talking earlier about what would you say to a child, throwing that back at yourself. How many times, yeah. you know, whoever's listened to this, have you been in emotional pain, but you've recovered from it? It might still be, you might still be wounded by it. I'm not taking that away from you, but, the, 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 but you've managed it. And the wound, emotional wounds are like physical wounds on the body, like trauma is. The brain naturally heals them. So just as much as you cut your hand and it heals, so does the heart and so does the soul. And so when things are really hard, there is a natural healing process. And actually, sometimes you don't need to do anything. So if you're watching this and you're thinking, I, I don't know what to do with myself, I, you know, I'm, I'm processing something from my childhood or something that's been very traumatic. If you've got the wherewithal to get support financially and you're in a place where you can do that practically as well, you know, you've got, you can get yourself there and things, brilliant. But if you can't, just don't be scared to just feel it and move it through and know that the brain does natural healing just as the body does. Natural healing. Many of my doctor friends say, my doctor friends are certainly, it's not going to be kind of what I say here. Uh, in fact, I'll, I'll name one because he said it on air once. Mm -hmm. So uh, Dr. David Unwin once said, uh, I spent my whole life prescribing, prescribing, prescribing. He's in his 60s now. Mm -hmm. And he said, nothing gives me greater pleasure now. Now I've learned to de-prescribe. Um, because if we're de-prescribing, then we're, we're, we're helping people get their lifestyle better and, and so on and so forth. Um, there are a lot of drugs for people uh, that have got depression uh, and anxiety. Are we over-prescribing in this area as a nation, or do you feel it's about right? Or just say I don't want to answer. No, it, it's, it's difficult. I'm not allowed to comment specifically on medication, but what I do see clinically is that it helps people. I would never push medication because it's not my role to either, but if I've got somebody working with me and they are so depressed that they really can't function, the NICE guidance would say um, that actually 50% of what drugs will help 50% and therapy will help 50%. So we right, know okay. from NICE guidelines that they do have their place and I certainly do see that. I also see the other side where people say, I've been on this high dose or whatever and it's not working. There's a lot about psychiatric drugs that, you know, for recently they've, they've sort of thought differently about depression and that it isn't actually necessarily about serotonin receptors so there's lots of we're still working things out but I think they certainly have their place clinically from what I see yeah absolutely 
look, it's been absolutely fabulous talking to you. I've learnt lots, and uh, I may relook at uh, reevaluate parenting skills. Up there. <laughs> uh, it's been Great. absolutely fabulous, and would love Thank to have you back much. another time. Absolutely happy to be here. Thank you. That is the wonderful Dr. Anna Simmons. Uh, please do subscribe below and stay tuned for our next episode.